Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and everyone who's watching uh, virtually on Facebook and be watching later on YouTube. Um, we're going to open up the morning worship service with scripture-led prayer, and I will be reading 5, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 65, verses 1 through 8. Under the heading, O God of our salvation. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your sign. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you once again in the name of Jesus, Father God. Lord, we come to the throne of grace once again, Lord, with all humility, Father God. We come before you and we praise you, Father God, for the privilege to be able to come before you once again, Lord God. And praise, all the praise is due to you, Father God. Lord, we say hallelujah, Father, in the name of Jesus this morning, Father God. Lord, we praise you, Father God, with our voices. We say hallelujah. Father God, we say it from uh, with our minds, Father God, and our thinking, Lord God, and in our hearts, Father God. What is within us, Father God? This morning, Lord God, we give you all praise, Father God, for you are holy, Father God. We meditate on your holiness this morning, Father God. Lord, you are holy, Father. You are righteous, Father God. Lord God, you're all-knowing, you're all-powerful, Father God. Lord God, that you are unlimited, Father God, limitless, Father God. Lord God, we praise your name, Father God. And to you, Father God, the sh uh, shall the vows be performed, Father God. Those things that we promised to you, Father God, those gifts and talents, Lord, that you bestowed upon us, Father God. Lord God, that help us, Father God, to do those things that we promise, Lord God, and forgive us, Father God, of our sins, Father God. Please, O oh God, we thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy upon us, Father God. Lord, we just thank you, Father God, and Lord, that we, Lord, that we ask for forgiveness this morning. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayer, Father God, all of our prayers and our supplications, Father God, the way that we communicate with you, Father God, and Lord, as we talk to you, Father God, Lord, we pray that we hear your voice, Father God, Lord, that, and that all, all, to you all, um, to you shall all flesh come, Father God, Lord, that we pray for that, Father God, we pray that all who do not know you shall come before you, Father God, all flesh, because in that time, Lord God, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, Father God. Lord, and when our iniquities, Father God, we feel like they're prevailing against us, Father God. Lord God, we have unconfessed sin, Father God. Lord God, when we, when we struggle, Lord God, sometimes daily, Father God, with sin, Father God, and when it seems as though the evil one is prevailing over us, Father, that you've atoned for our transgressions, Father God, that victory was won on the cross at Calvary, and we just praise your name for that, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. And blessed is the one you choose. We thank you, Father, for choosing us, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that before we were in our mother's wombs, Father God, that you chose us, Father God. Before the foundation of the world, Father God, that you chose us, Father God. And you bring us near to dwell in your courts, Father God. Lord God, that we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, Father God. You are a host, Father God. You've been a wonderful host, Father God. Lord God, you give us food, clothing, and shelter, Father God, which you promised in your word, and you've given us so much more, Father God. 
that you're a provider, Father God. You're a healer, Father God. Lord God, you're a protector, Lord God. You are a shield, Lord God. Lord God, everything about you, Father God. Lord, that we thank you for loving us, Father God. We thank you that in our sins, Father God, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross, be buried and be resurrected from the dead, Lord God. And the holiness of your temple, Father God, the holiness, Lord God, you are holy. And we say this morning, holy, holy, holy. We praise your name, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Lord, that your temple is holy, Father God. Your house is holy, Father God. Lord, that gives us pause, Father God, to look at our own house, Father God. To look at ourselves, Father God. Look at our lives, Father God. Lord, we, we pray, Lord God, that we have trust and we have faith in you, O oh God. In your awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, Father God. Whether whatever it is that we, we wait, may not want to hear it, Father God, but you answer us with righteousness. Because always your answer is right, Father God. Because you are right, Father God. That there's no sin in you, Lord God. That there's nothing but holiness and righteousness in you, O oh God. O oh God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, Lord, you are limitless, Father God. Your expanse, Father God, is limitless, Father God. Lord, you can see to the ends of the earth. You can see the farthest of the seas because you made those things, Father God. Lord, in your strength established the mountains being girded with might, Lord God. You're so mighty, you're so strong, Father God. There's no strength like you, Father God. Our strength is in you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. And Lord God, you still the roaring of the seas the roaring of the waves, Father God. No earthquake, nor tornado, no hurricane happens without you, Lord God. And Lord God, you have the power, Lord God, to still all of those things. And then to all of the peoples, Lord God, with all of the chaos and the turmoil and the hate, Father God, going on in this country and in this world, Father God. Lord, we ask, Lord God, for a calming, Father God. We ask you, Father God, that all come to you, Father God, and have trust and have faith in you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth, Father God, are in awe at your signs. And Lord, there are those, Father God, who are literally at the ends of the earth, Father God. Those who are so far away from you, Lord God. Lord God, we pray for those people this morning, Father God. The unsaved, Father God. Those who are lost, Father God. Those who have no hope, Father God. There is a hope. There is a hope in you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And among those whom you call, Lord God. Those of you chosen, Father God, Lord, help us, Father God, not just here, Father God, but all across the world, Father God, all of those who you blessed to be chosen, Father God, help us, Lord God, to live godly lives, Father God, to live lives of worship, Father God, and to do what we've been called to do, Lord God, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in these final days, oh God. Lord God, we bless your name, Father God. We bless the morning worship service, Father God. We praise you, Father God. We pray that you bless us today, Father God. Lord God, from the singing of songs, Father God, to the, to the playing of instruments, Father God, to the sound, Father God. Lord, we thank you for those things, Lord God. Lord God, this prayer right now, Father God. Lord God, and to the man of God who will deliver the sermon this morning, Father God, to deliver the word, Father God. Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord God, that you bless him, Father God, that the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart be pleasing in your sight, for you are his rock, his redeemer, his Lord, his Savior, Father God. Lord, we praise you, we give thanks, we love you, we honor you this morning, we say hallelujah, and we come to worship you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Good morning. As we worship our young people, young brother Lewis is here to sing a song that says, I need you. God bless you.
Good morning, good morning. Come on, let's praise the Lord right here, right now, right where you are. It's an easy song. My hallelujahs belong to you. Mm -hmm. My hallelujahs belong to you. Help me sing this song. My hallelujahs belong to you. Oh, my 
falleth short of your glory. We thank you for your word that reminds us that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we desire to have a fresh encounter with you on this morning. We acknowledge you as holy and righteous. There is none like you in all the earth. God, we need the healing in this land. So we appeal to you as Jehovah Rapha. God that healeth me. Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land." Lord, we acknowledge that we have turned our backs on you. as a result of us turning our backs on you, Lord, we are facing some of the issues that we're dealing with in this day. But your word is conditional. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, the condition is then I will be here from heaven. Forgive their sin and heal their land. So God, we come as your people. We're acknowledging our sin before you. Lord God, we have a bill on the books. House Bill 5, we pray, God, that you will stop it. Would not allow this evil bill to be passed. God, we need you. We need you now more than ever. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. All of the saints said, Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to service, if you will turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 4, we will continue in on this series, The Providence of God. We've highlighted the fact that God is sovereign, and we teach through the book of Job on Wednesday evenings, we acknowledge that God is sovereign. We've identified the sovereignty of God as his Ability to do what he wants to do to whomever he wants to do it to, when he wants to do it, however long he wants to do it, without getting our approval, because he is in charge, he is sovereign, he is overall. In the book of Esther, in the book of Esther, we are talking about the providence of God. Providence of God is somewhat buried to the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is he is over all. He has all control. He has all power. But his providence is the fact that his hand is he is uh, silently, quite often behind the scenes, detailing every aspect of our lives. In God's providence, sometimes he allows bad things to happen, and we don't like it, but in his providence, he is always working all things out for the good to those who love the Lord. As we look at the book of Esther, we see God's providence in the hand and in the life of Esther. Esther was a young girl who lost her father and mother, her cousin actually, uh, took her on and raised her as his own child. And providentially, God raises her to a place where she is going to represent 
God's people. We'll pick up this morning in Esther chapter 4. For last week we asked the question, why does God allow things to happen in people's lives? We also said that we don't really understand why God allows things to happen like in chapter 3 of Esther. Why would God allow Haman, a wicked ruler, to, to rise in status under King Ahasuerus? Ultimately, we saw last week that Haman plotted to destroy, to annihilate the Jewish population. Why would God allow someone to get into office so that they can annihilate his people? Sometimes we just don't understand. This morning I want to talk about risky faith. Risky faith. I've said this for years that there will come a time, and I don't claim to be a prophet, but I said this for years, that there will come a time when being a believer in Jesus Christ will cost us more than we're used to paying. And we're living in that time right now where the government is really forcing, forcing things down on the people of God. And so to be a person of faith in this day and time is risky. But we'll learn today that at some point we're going to have to act in courage. Courage does not mean that we're not fearful at times, but courage means to be responsive in the face of fear, to not be stagnated. Even though something negative might happen to you, we are just like the Hebrew boys. We should bow to not bow down to this world system. Morning, there are four things I want to highlight as we look through this narrative in the book of Esther, Esther chapter 4. The first thing I want to highlight is Mordecai mourns incessantly. Mordecai mourns incessantly. That's in verses 1 through 3. Secondly, I'll highlight that Esther inquires about Mordecai's mourning. Thirdly, Mordecai utilizes his influence with Esther in verses 13 and 14. And then lastly, we'll highlight the fact that God's people intercede for Esther in verses 15 through 17. Lord, do bless your word. Illuminate it such that we would be impacted to the point of life change. Lord, we know that it is not just for communication, but for transformation. Lord, allow your word to transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Esther chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes. Now, what had been done? Of course, Mordecai had heard of the decree issued by the king, suggested by the evil leader, Haman, that they should annihilate all the Jews. And if you remember, Haman was the one who would not bow down, I'm sorry, Mordecai was the one who would not bow down to Haman. And so as a result of Mordecai not bowing down to Haman, Haman decided to tell the, the king that you should annihilate all the Jews. They have different customs and they don't obey your laws. And the king was compliant and he wrote a decree issuing that all the Jews would be annihilated. You can only imagine how Mordecai must have felt, having been the catalyst by which Haman would use 
to mortify, to, to, to destroy the Jews. And so his response is apropos. Chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was able to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Mordecai mourned incessantly. He would not stop mourning. And, and why would he? Because he is now, because he would not bow, all of the Jews are in danger of being annihilated. In verse 3 it says, In each and every province where the command and decree of the king had come, there was great mourning among with the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay on sackcloth lay on sackcloth and ashes we're talking about a response to this decree all of the Jews in the province knowing that they're going to be annihilated they go into great mourning in 127 provinces great mourning among the Jews with fasting. Let me just pause here. We've talked about fasting before, and fasting is, is putting off of the physical for a greater spiritual need. And at this point, the people, the Jews, understand that there is a great spiritual need. So much so that they don't even have a desire to eat. They are fasting, they are putting off of the physical. And, and usually in the scriptures, when you see fasting, it is always accompanied with prayer. Even though they don't mention prayer here, in the scriptures, when you see fasting, fasting is always connected to prayer. So no doubt, they're in great mourning. You ever feel like God is not listening to your prayers? In chapter 3, we ask the question, what? I don't understand. Why would God allow Haman to get put in this position in the first place? We can celebrate God when he elevates Esther to a place of the queen, but when God allows evil things and evil rulers to rule, we say, what? I don't understand. But faith is risky. The true measure of our faith is, is not when everything is going well, but when all hell breaks loose. Right. So Mordecai, as well as all those in the province, there's great mourning and it says and among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. There is incessant Mourning, weeping, wailing. What if you got a message this morning that all the Christians are going to die at a certain day on a certain time? And, and certainly we would probably respond the same way. We would be weeping and wailing and crying out to God, repenting. Which brings us to Verses 4 through 12, Esther inquires about Mordecai's mourning. Look at what it says. Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen rhymed with anguish. Esther is not aware of this decree. Esther is not aware of all that is going on. So it says, her maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen writhed in anguish, and she sent garments to clothe Mordecai, that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. So what is wrong with Esther? Well, Esther, if you remember in this harem, she is isolated from all the rest of the population. A lot of the things that are going on in the province, these women are, are the oblivious so she doesn't know about this decree. It seems that she is callous, but she is isolated. That is the nature of this harem. In fact, we'll see that she hasn't been in the king's presence in 30 days, so she is unaware of all of the things that have taken place. And so 
so she sends garments to clothe Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Verse 5 says, Then Esther summoned Hattach from, from the king's eunuchs, who the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn, say learn, learn. she didn't know, to learn what was what, what, what this was and why it was. So Hattach uh, went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told them, or he told them all that happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. And so Mordecai gives Hattach Basically, he gives them the lowdown on all that is taking place. This man is basically a messenger between Esther and Mordecai. And she sends him out to Mordecai to find out what's going on. And then Mordecai gives him all of the information, verse 8. It says he also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead for him for her people. Mordecai refuses to take the clothes. He, re he refuses to, 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 to straighten up. He, he refuses to conform. He is in mourning. He is in prayer. He is in, he's in anguish as a result of all that is going on. And Esther makes an inquiry. And now we get to the point in this narrative where faith becomes quite risky. Says in verses 9, it says, Hattach came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hattach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king into his inner court who was not summoned. He has but one law, that he would be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And he goes on to say, and, and so, so basically, Esther, after getting this message from Mordecai, Mordecai said, listen, you got to go to the king and you got to tell the king what's taking place. Now the king knows what's taking place, but he has no idea that Esther, who is a, not, who's a new queen, is a Jew. And so Mordecai says, listen, you got to go tell the king what's going on. And she says, listen, I don't know if you knew this, Mordecai. I love you and I know you raised me and all of that, but I don't know if you know the rules. Here's the rules. If anyone goes before the king and they're not summoned to come before the king, they have only one thing that can happen, and that is, if he does not accept them, they must die. You say, well, what sense does that make? Well, it makes a lot of sense when you're the king and people are trying to kill you. Nobody, uh, nobody can just come into the presence of the king without being summoned because there were those who were trying to kill the king. In fact, we heard a little bit earlier, Mordecai overheard and some of the king's guards that were trying to kill the king. So this was basically a safeguard for the king. And she reminds Mordecai that this is the law. This is the way we roll here. You realize that I can die unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. She goes on to say, and I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. <laughs> it seems at this point that Esther is in between a rock and a hard place. And sometimes we find ourselves as believers, even in this day, between a rock and a hard place. Are we being silent when we really should be speaking up? 
It's not, listen, it's not necessary that we're going to die for speaking up. It's, it's perhaps that people are going to look at us a little bit differently if we speak against uh, the schemes of the devil. Will I be silent in the face of uh, 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 these, these bills on equity that, that says that you can, uh, a young man can go into the bathroom with a young lady? This gender equality that's on the books right now that we need to really pay attention to. I'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. And, and, and you all know I don't talk a whole lot about politics, but at some point, our faith has got to become risky. We have to step up. We've got to speak up. We've got to stand up for what thus saith the Lord. And again, it may cost us something. So we see that Mordecai mourns incessantly. Esther inquires about Mordecai's mourning in verses 4 through 12. And then in verses 13 and 14, we'll see Mordecai utilizes his influence with Esther. Look at what it says in verse 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. <laughs> so obviously more than one messenger because it says Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Mordecai says, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. I don't believe that Esther forgot who she was, but because of the nature of things, because of the, the impact of what was going to happen, he had to remind her who she was. And he basically says to her, Esther, listen, you are not exempt. You are a Jew, and when the Jews go down, you're going to go down with them. You're not exempt. Listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're not exempt from the things that are going on in this world. We're not exempt from cancer. We're not exempt from persecution. We're not exempt from sickness. And, and those who preach that we are exempt, they're lying to you. We're not exempt from difficulty. We're not exempt from heartache and, and trouble. Yes, God will watch over his people. He sovereignly is in control, but he providentially at times allows things to happen in our lives, and we don't know why he allows those things to happen, but we know that he is working all things out together for our good. That's the difference. We know that when we're in a bad situation, God is going to take that bad, and he's going to turn it into good. He's going to take our mess and he's going to use our mess as fertilizer for something that is great. We're not exempt. Verse 13 again, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. Verse 14, for if you remain silent at this time, in fact, verse 14 is a theme for the whole book. Everything points to this verse. For if you remain silent at this time, relief, listen, and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attain royalty for such a time as this. The famous words of Esther, uh, of, of Mordecai, for such a time as this. I don't want you to gloss over this, but he reminds her here in verse 14, he utilizes his influence because he raised her and he loves her. And remember, the 
but he would come to the to the gate to find out what was going on with her. And so they had a good relationship. So Mordecai utilizes that influence that he has for such a time as this. And he reminds her, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now, I just think that's powerful. I think that's powerful because when you look at Mordecai's response, you look at him in verses 1 through 3, he is mourning incessantly because of what is going on, but at the same time, in the back of Mordecai's mind, he knows that God will make a way somehow. Listen, we've got to have that type of faith, that same type of faith was expressed by Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who stood before King Nebuchadnezzar and said, Oh King, live forever. We know that our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, but even if he does not, I'm still not going to bow. We've got to have that type of resolve in 2021 that even if God does not come through in the way that we think he ought to come through, we're still not going to bow. We're not going to bow. I know the world system is, is, is throwing all of this inclusion and we love everybody because, listen, we know that according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we were among those who lived in sin. We were born in iniquity, shaken in iniquity, and we were headed to destruction. And God, in his sovereign grace and mercy, he pulled us out of darkness, placed us into the light of his son. We're not better than anybody else, but we live by a different standard. We don't live like those in the world. You're in the world, but not of the world. We are ambassadors. We are children of the Most High God. Thank you. He says, for if you remain silent at this time, God is going to deliver us. I like that. Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews. When you're walking in the darkness. You've got to stand on what you know about God. You've got, to, you've got to stand on what you know about God to be true about him, to be true about his character, to be true about his nature, because a, a, a difficulty has a way of giving us spiritual amnesia. God had positioned Esther for such a time as this. I believe Mordecai, as he was saying these things, he was thinking back to the covenant that God had made with his people in Genesis chapter 12. Now keep in mind the, the plot is to destroy, to annihilate all of the Jews. Mordecai probably thought back to Genesis chapter 12, where it talks about God's covenant with his people. It says, now the Lord, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, and for your, from your father's house to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and, and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis chapter 17 reiterates this covenant that God has made with his chosen people, the Jews. Verse 1, chapter 17, now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, I am El Shaddai. He says, walk before me 
and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, but I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God and you and to your descendants after you. How many know that God is a covenant keeping God? Right now it doesn't look like God is honoring his word but he is providentially going to work all things out for our good and ultimately his glory. Mordecai says, listen, Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief is going to come and deliverance will arise for the Jews, but from another place, it may not be you. And by the way, uh, God's plan is not uh, resting on you. Listen, I, I want to be used by God. But listen, God's uh, kingdom agenda is not a uh, contingent upon my obedience or disobedience. He'll use somebody else. This is why it, it, it frustrates me so much that there is so much division in this nation because of who is in the White House. Listen, God's agenda does not stop because of who is in the White House. But certainly we want people in the White House who are going to represent the interests of Christ. But listen, God does not need the, the White House to push his agenda. Listen, when all was going, when all hell was broken, uh, breaking loose, and he said in 2 Chronicles, all of this stuff that's going on in the land, if my people, his people, listen, we are the answer. The church is the answer. Not the White House. And by the way, everybody that steps into the church is not pushing the agenda of the king. Right. People are asking, well, what about churches failing and churches that are that are going down? Well, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So if there's an organization, even if it calls itself a church, then it is being prevailed against. It is something, but it is not the church that Christ is building. So you need to find the church that Christ is building and get involved and get on board. Listen. God has positioned us just as he has positioned Esther for such a time as this. He says, deliverance is going to come from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Listen, you are where you are. Because God wants you there right now. And it's time for you to stand up and speak up. And listen, you listen, you can't, you can't go to work and spend all your time playing candy crusher and then speak up talking about Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Listen, your lifestyle needs to be consistent to the standard that you say you are espousing. 
Now listen, if we are not living a lifestyle that's consistent with that which we believe, we are being hypocritical and no wonder the world is not listening when we speak. Remember Daniel. Daniel was praying several times a day. This was his routine. He didn't break his routine even when he was in a foreign land. He cultivated in relationship with God in a foreign land. When he was thrown into the lion's den, he developed that relationship and God brought him out of the lion's den. And his faith was able to help Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is why they were able to say to the king, listen, we know that God is able to deliver us. We know our God. We know we, we know what God did to Daniel when they threw him in the lion's den. So we know that God is able to deliver us. But even if even if he does it, oh, that's, that's listen, that's risky faith. That's risky faith to say, God, you can do what you want to do even if it causes That's the type of faith that moves God. He says, listen, you got to remember, Esther, you were a widow. Well, not a widow, but you were an orphan. Mom and dad was gone. God put it on my heart to raise you. You're a beautiful young lady, and it's your beauty that placed you and, and, and gave you favor to the king and now you're the queen and this is not the time to be passive. This is not the time to sit back. Your people's lives are in danger and who knows if God has raised you up for such a time as this. Mordecai mourns incessantly. Esther inquires about Mordecai's mourning. Mordecai utilizes his influence with Queen Esther. And then lastly here in verses 15 through 17, God's people intercede for Esther. Then Esther See, when we read the scriptures, and sometimes we read this in a chronological manner, and we think that things happen just like that, but sometimes there, there are pauses in between. In fact, if you remember, the book of Esther is right in the book of, uh, it's in between um, Ezra, chapters 1 and chapter 6, and then there's the book of Esther, and then chapter, verse, chapter 7 through the end of the book of Esther, the book of Esther. So everything is not chronological. So look at here in verse 15. God's people intercede for Esther. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my maidens will also fast in the same way. Mordecai gets through. Esther remembers who she is. And immediately she is going to respond. But she is going to respond in a way that she is not responding out of her flesh. She says, listen, go. She tells and her servant to go to Mordecai says, go assemble all the Jews. Assemble the congregation. Assemble them all, it says, who are found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat, don't drink. Listen, this, is, this involves all of us. I need you. If I'm going to be in the place that God wants me to be, I need the, the, I need the support of the, the people of God. So fast, I need God's power. I need, I need God's favor as I go into the king, knowing that because I go into go, because I go in there, I could actually lose my life. So I need 
God's favor. So assemble all the Jews who are bound in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night, or day. He, she says, I'm going to do the same, and I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus, I will go. Say, I will go. Listen, after all your fasting and praying for whatever it is that you've been fasting and praying for, when God says go, you got to be willing to go. And see, we fasting and praying so, so that we can stay in a comfortable state. We fasting and praying so that no hurt, harm, or danger will come upon us. But she is praying a risky prayer. She is establishing a risky faith. She says, and thus, I will go to the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. I mean, are you, are you at that place? I mean, really, this is not for somebody else. Oh, I wish a sister so-and-so was here to hear this. I went brother so-and-so, this is for you. Are you at the place where you willing to do whatever it is that God says do? Well, I might lose my job. Esther was at that place where she said, and remember, she's in a comfortable place. Same as Nehemiah. Nehemiah's in Susa. Nehemiah's living well and finds out about the condition of the walls and gets God's favor to go back and rebuild the, the walls of Jerusalem. And guess what? He had opposition. Sam Ballard and Tobiah constantly agitating, trying to stop the work. Are you willing to die? Do what God has called you to do. Y'all remember years ago that I would I would say, you know, um, I'll probably die and we laughed and we chuckled, but this is that time. This is that time when it will cost us perhaps our lives to stand up yeah. and proclaim the word of God. says, if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. Risky faith. And so what happens? Well, we'll have to come back next week. And I, I wanted to mention, again, you, you guys hardly ever hear me talk about politics. I don't tell you who to vote for. I try to preach the word of God and, and throw this um, and let you do what your heart convicts you to do as far as voting. I think you should vote. There is a uh, equality that is on the books now in the house. I don't know if you're aware of it. It is, they call HB5, the Equality Act. And rather than go real deep into it, I'm, I'm just going to let you know that if this bill passes, the church will be forced. I'm going to jail. That's, that's one, because I'm not going to agree with that. But that's, that's number one. I'm going to jail. And that means that all of our young ministers that I've been training, y'all need to step up. And y'all need to be willing to go to jail, too, because we're going to preach the word of God. We're not going to water down the word of God to accommodate anybody. What can you do about this equality act? And here's the thing. I've always said, in fact, we just turned there. I've always said that we must not.
not look down on people because of where they are. We've got to remember where we came from. And because God brought us out, however, there is an expectation that we don't live like the world lives. It's not that we're better than those in the world. We're just different. We have the spirit of the living God in us that gives us the means to say no to our flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So we're not looking down on any group of people because such were some of us. But at the same time, we are not going to lower God's standard because there are those who don't want to live up to his standard. This is where it's, it's risky. And this is where we need to we need to stand up. As the body of Christ, I'm not representing just rising star. I'm saying as the body of Christ, we need to be praying, we need to be calling our senators and letting them know, listen, we do not want this Equality Act to pass. Now, of course, we know that God is sovereign. We do what we can, and we leave the rest up to God. And so, your senator's number, 202-224-3121. Call your senator. Know on this equality act. That's 202-224-3121. Brother, if you would put that down in the... Say it again, please. 202-224-3121. Now, because you have never heard me really push politics here in this pulpit, you know the seriousness of this act, this bill. And who knows that God has positioned you for such a time as this. Father God, we come. We do acknowledge our need for you, as Lewis sang beautifully early on.
Give us the boldness to speak up. Give us the compassion to share the gospel that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried and God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. God providentially put us in spaces where we can share your love with those who need to know it. Give us the words to speak and the grace to do it. I just want you to make it.